I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to begin with something that I will probably start doing more of, and um, which is to spend a few moments at the start uh, just as, as individuals and as a group together, offering good wishes to anyone you like. And in particular, I'm going to use this time myself, certainly tonight, uh, in remembrance of one or more people for you that you may have lost or you um, who, or who may be in difficulty right now, aging, perhaps illness, perhaps they've recently died. And um, for tonight, for myself, I want to name a, a, a friend and teacher and major benefactor, Wes Nisker who's really worth uh, looking up if you don't know about Wes. For those who do, there's probably a smile amidst a tear thinking about him. Uh, comedian, funny, deep Dharma teacher, highly practiced, longtime editor of Inquiring, Mag Inquiring Mind magazine, um, and just a wonderful person who, in my own case, uh, when I taught my very first workshop at Spirit Rock with the audacious title, The Neurology of Awakening, with my friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Mendias. Uh, we were the new kids on the block doing PowerPoint slides, <laughs> you know, in the dorm hall. It was really different uh, and definitely uh, action-packed uh, workshop, jammed full. And it could have been the end of my teaching career <laughs> in the Buddhist world, but it was really the beginning because Wes happened to be in the audience. And he told the powers that be, hey, these new kids on the block, give them another chance. And that was the beginning of many, many doors opening for me. Without Wes's help there, I don't know if I'd be here with you right now. So I just want to offer my sincere gratitude and, and blessing for Wes and deep, warm feelings for his uh, his family, particularly his daughter Rose, who I know. And um, if you knew Wes, you might join me in this. And if not, just feel free to offer your good wishes in any way you like to anyone you like uh, for the next minute or so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for participating in that. I was speaking of Wes Nisker, and I got the word uh, this morning that he had that he had died. I don't know exactly when, but it was quite recently. Okay. And that's actually a very appropriate segue to what I hope to talk with you about tonight. Um, which is the Buddha's response to the fundamental facts of impermanence, both at the micro scale of, you know, continually changing experiences, um, you know, on a time scale of fractions of a second, and then on the macro scale of uh, the ways in which all, you know, uh, phenomena that arise due to conditions have the nature eventually of passing away including um, a dear friend whose body is, uh, is, you know, who's died. And so the Buddha's response to that is summarized in many kinds of ways, the um, surviving written record of his teachings in the language of Pali uh, or Chinese or, or perhaps another language or so along with it. Um, they're very extensive teachings, but the heart of it, arguably, are summarized as um, Four Noble Truths. 
truths technically for the noble ones who I think are drawn to these truths by the nobility that is already within them in the sense of a, a longing for awakening or a fundamental wakefulness and benevolence as I spoke about in the meditation. And in the process of engaging these truths, which can be approached as tasks, not just as truths, um, that process ennobles us along the way. So let's consider these uh, four ennobling truths. I'm going to explore them with you and right now here as a kind of very direct um, summary of hardcore Buddhist practice, or a lot of it, certainly in terms of early Buddhism, original Buddhism, before its developments through Tibetan, Chinese, and Japanese, and onward Buddhism, um, Chan and Zen, uh, and then eventually into Pure Land. So consider this as a real opportunity to look squarely at your own practice and what it's like to be you and what might serve you uh, in your deepening in practice and your appreciation of the, of the fundamentals, the essences of it all. So the first, of the, the first of the noble truths is in the language dukkha. And uh, I'm going to be summarizing a lot of material for those of you that are very technically knowledgeable and very deep practitioners, including my friend Jim French. So feel free, if you like, to put in tech sources into the chats or comments and so forth. Um, and again, this is my version. This is my version with all the, the errors are my own. So dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, typically spelled dukkha. The truth of dukkha, there is dukkha. It's not that um, except in one regard, everything is dukkha. It's just, yeah, there's dukkha. So what is dukkha? What is dukkha? Dukkha is routinely mistranslated as suffering, which has many bad implications for practice. What dukkha actually consists of is three things. First, there's the observation that some experiences are unpleasant, even agonizingly so. Inevitably, living includes some unpleasant experiences. That seems true, okay? Second attribute of dukkha is that all pleasant experiences end one way or another. They change, they become something else. That also is true. And the third attribute of dukkha is the broad generalization that applies to all experiential phenomena and arguably to most, if not all, of the attributes of the physical universe, in that everything, certainly everything in our stream of consciousness, uh, is made of parts that are connected and changing. Thus, nothing has absolute self-existence, absolute solidity, absolute identity, absolute essence, which means that any effort to um, turn that which is connected and to separate it in efforts to hold on to what is changing, um, including the sense of personal identity, uh, are a prescription for suffering, okay? So we have these three attributes and you can observe them directly in your own experience. And you can realize when I describe them, the suffering is not inherent in any of them. It's not inherent. This is the good news of the Buddha Dharma. If life is suffering, we're screwed. And the best we can do is meditate to such a point that somehow we avoid a rebirth. And that's kind of the logical progression you'll find in some quarters, um, which I just think is deeply wrong and not what the Buddha taught. So for example, yes, there are unpleasant experiences. There is pain, but we, do we need to suffer it? We suffer it um, when we you know, get angry at ourselves for making a mistake. Uh, we blame others for our pain. Uh, we uh, feel ashamed that we have pain. These are ways that we make ourselves suffer, but pain otherwise is just pain. It's just pain. It's just unpleasant. Second, yes, pleasant experiences end, um, but they're often followed by another pleasant experience. Meanwhile, even as this pleasant experience ends in this particular tile in the mosaic of your, 
you know, mind, other pleasant experiences can be happening over here. And um, uh, unpleasant experiences end as well. So the fact that pleasant experiences end does not inherently produce suffering. There's a kind of weaselly term, in my view, that gets slipped in here that says, well, the fact that all experiences are ending, including pleasant ones, makes all, uh, makes all experiences, including really pleasurable experiences, unsatisfactory. Notice the what gets slipped in there, unsatisfactory. Now, in English, unsatisfactory is a drag. You know, like kid uh, turns in a book report in school, that's an unsatisfactory book report. <laughs> that's a ding, uh, right? That uh, dinner I had with my friend, that was a really unsatisfactory meal. That was an unsatisfactory tofu burger. That's a real ding on the experience. It's not a neutral evaluation. It's a negative evaluation, unsatisfactory. Well, what in the world makes this moment of experience unsatisfactory? It's only unsatisfactory if we try to create permanent satisfaction in it. If we let go and we just let our experiences flow in the instant of experiencing a wholesome, beautiful, lovely, tasty, et cetera, experience, it's thoroughly enjoyable and thoroughly satisfying in the moment it's occurring. What makes experiences unsatisfying, unsatisfactory, is our attempt to make them permanently satisfying, which is endlessly unsuccessful because they're continually changing because of that third attribute of dukkha. So you can see inherently that dukkha is a condition. It's a description of certain features. It's not the entirety of all the phenomena in reality, but it's a fair description, certainly, of major features in the stream of our experiencing. What creates suffering is when the second noble truth gets involved, the second ennobling truth of recognizing, in Pali, tanha, routinely translated as craving. Craving plus dukkha equals suffering. Dukkha without craving is equanimity, is peace, is frictionless contentment. It's like living is a kind of rope moving through our hands. This is a metaphor from Joseph Goldstein. Um, as the rope moves through our hands, some of the fibers in it are kind of pokey and unpleasant. As it moves through our hands, some of the fibers are, are really beautiful. So far, so good. No suffering, just experiences. It's when we clench around um, the rope. It's when we apply tanha to it, T-A-N-H-A, the second noble truth for craving. Um, that's when we create friction. This is the fundamental engine of suffering, tanha. Suffering is not inherent in living. Now, as biological animals, beings that evolved very layered systems to crave, it sometimes intensely with drives to fight with or run from what's unpleasant or to hold on to and get greedy about and get possessive about what's pleasant. Yeah, the tendencies of Tanha are pretty intense. In a lot of ways, deep practice is swimming against numerous um, highly evolved biological currents, which for me is appropriate to recognize and appreciate, um, you know, why it can be challenging to practice. But uh, with practice increasingly, and that's what the third and fourth ennobling truths are about, we can live in dukkha free of tanha, or at least freer and freer along the way. And that is a profoundly hopeful possibility. I'm struck often by the consequences of this mistranslation, this misguided translation of dukkha as suffering uh, and the preoccupation and the, and the erroneous presumption that living is inherently unsatisfactory. Um, I think it's a kind of strategy that, you know, I can understand why it developed to, mot to motivate 
people, particularly in monastic settings, toward renunciation. If you're making the case that ordinary life is basically a drag, it's inherently unsatisfactory, uh, it's full, it's inherently suffering. Uh, you know, if you're going to make that case, um, that's a way to motivate people to practice in renunciate settings, disengaged from the world, and to practice fiercely so that somehow they will achieve various attainments that will disrupt their rebirth into this veil of tears. I mean, I get that. I get that. But I think it's possible to be intensely motivated to practice with tanha without um, um, equating dukkha with suffering. Because if dukkha is suffering, we're really screwed. No. Dukkha is simply dukkha. It's what we add to it with tanha, with craving, that makes us suffer and harm ourselves and others. Wow. This is such good news. You'll, if you pay attention to Western Buddhist uh, stuff, certainly in English, I don't know what the translations are in other languages, but since probably some of the primary um, you know, translations in early um, movement of Buddhism into the West were through English, this, this, this approach may have you know, infected other languages as well, but you'll routinely find that there's this conflation of uh, dukkha with suffering. For example, you'll find uh, that the uh, five aggregates, the five deconstructed elements of experience as form, <clears throat> bare perception essentially, bare, bare recognition of sense data, form, as well as all of material reality, form, and then the hedonic tone, the feeling tone, the vedana of experience, third perception, which has to do with um, you know, categorizing things, labeling them, drawing upon memory. These are the five piles of mental phenomena kind of sorted by the Buddha. Then in the fourth pile, we have all the other mental contents, um, hopes, dreams, sorrows, thoughts, feelings, you know, complex sensations, somatic markers, et cetera, et cetera. And then awareness, the five aggregates. They are routinely described um, as suffering. Well, they're dukkha. Because all elements, all five elements of our uh, consciousness are have the nature of dukkha in that sometimes things are unpleasant at there, uh, pleasant things in the stream of consciousness end, and everything in the stream of consciousness exists emptily, uh, absent, empty of uh, absolute essence or identity. Yeah, that's true, but that's not inherently suffering. So... It's really freeing to replace the mistranslation of English uh, in various suttas with simply the word dukkha and know what dukkha is. And then you can see the Buddha is getting at a, a, a radical, a liberating a point that um, it's within our power to transform our relationship to dukkha uh, and live with less and less tanha, less and less of the craving that creates suffering and harm. That's fantastic. And so the question becomes, what are you doing in your own life to live with dukkha with less and less tanha? Or as I kind of summarized for myself, and I'm still working on it, uh, walking out of a retreat many years ago, cling less, love more. It kind of summarized a lot of uh, Dharma practice for me. Cling less, love more. Okay. So then we have the third ennobling truth in Pali Narodha, uh, which is often translated as cessation. Hmm, cessation of what? And then I see something from my, you know, someone I've learned a lot from, Brenda there. Uh, the Buddha made a really important distinction between tanha and chanda. In other words, between craving and wholesome desire. I too, have an intense desire for social justice. And sometimes, I admit it, some tanha gets in that mix. Okay. And sometimes we do have to live by tanha. We crave um, pulling our kids out of a burning building, uh, maybe. We are, might be in a desperate physical situation and we just 
totally get intense to survive. Um, okay. But much as we can, you know, be aware of when you're getting into tanha and disengage as soon as you can. And um, to find that there are ways to be very determined, even fiery, passionate. None of those are anti-Buddhist qualities. It's the contraction, the, in, the insistence, the personal identification with uh, various things that are the hallmarks of, of craving. In your body, you can feel the kind of uh, contraction around things or intensity around things, insistence around things. Hallmarks, hallmarks of craving. Okay, so then we have cessation. Cessation is a really interesting word. And I think we can understand it in three extremely important kinds of ways. Um, one way to understand it is in terms of um, uh, a very unusual condition that, that occurs in a general sense in the minds of a meditator, in the mind of a meditator, typically classically moving through the right concentration element of the Eightfold Path through the four jhanas, these non-ordinary states of consciousness, and then moving into these additional four sometimes called formless jhanas or sometimes called formless realms. Are they actually realms or are they extraordinary um, states of mind within ordinary reality? Whatever they are, in that progression, then there's nirodha, cessation. And in that cessation, an encounter and immersion in nibbana. How do we understand that? Now we're into some pretty hardcore stuff. One way to understand it is that there's simply a progression of um, states of consciousness that become increasingly subtle. Uh, various people um, describe them. I know numerous people who've gone through these trainings through Paul Oxidow and, and other sources. Um, Shinzen Young, um, Tina Rasmussen, Shala Catherine, uh, Stephen Snyder, um, couple other people, Lee Brasington, um, someone else will come to my mind in a moment, really teach this progression. It's just many, many people have moved through this progression. One way to understand cessation, cessation rather, is that there's a cessation of any kind of ordinary consciousness within, ordinary, within an ordinary body occurring within ordinary reality. Lights out. Uh, Stephen Snyder, who will be coming back and teaching pretty soon as a guest teacher, described it to me as basically in the approach to cessation, there are some remaining wholesome qualities of mind. It's not like getting a, you know, an anesthetic that knocks you out and then you wake up later. And then when you come back, it's as if you're coming back from the most refreshing nap of your life. Uh, he describes it as also being aware of the furniture rearranging. And I've heard other people talk about the return from cessation as creating a tremendous opportunity for insight into the utterly constructed, including biologically constructed nature of the stream of consciousness. And in that recognition of its, of how it gets built from the bottom up um, is a non-attachment to it. There is a, a greater non-attachment to it because you just see how constructed it is. It's being made by reality locally and helps us increasingly disidentify from it and lighten up in our attachments to it and thus be less um, carried away by tanha, by craving. That's one way to understand cessation, okay? It's an extraordinary state of unconsciousness that has very beneficial effects that have been well identified and well practiced in meditative traditions. I have not experienced it, okay? Second way to understand cessation is that it's an encounter with an unconditioned reality. This is a very debated topic in the Buddhist tradition. Um, people who are scientific materialists, maybe you know serious atheists or you know real um, maybe agnostic, but basically they just they're not interested. In, or they don't think there is an alternative to reality to the Big Bang universe. Others, and in my view, the Buddha was indeed 
speaking to this because in my view and experience, it's actually true that there is an unconditioned reality. Unconditionality is its primary, or it's, is certainly its minimal distinguishing feature in that um, there's the absence of conditioned phenomena. Therefore, there's no time. It's eternity. It's timeless. There's not movement in it. There's a vastness, a stillness. And um, one way of understanding Nibbana is that this is the realm of Nibbana, the unconditioned, unconditionality, um, represented in, in Chan in some ways as absence, it's the fertile field in which presence is continually emerging and passing away. Language breaks down. Um, you know, many people make the maneuver, I think it's a maneuver of kind of evading um, a discussion of whether or not there actually is an unconditioned reality uh, as in the ground of all. Um, they say, well, it's not useful to, to, to describe, to, to get into ontology about something, does something actually exist? I think if there actually is an ultimate unconditioned ground, why the heck not be interested in it? You know, it either exists or it doesn't. Either one's remarkable. Uh, Either option is remarkable. So that's the second way of understanding cessation. And then a third way of understanding cessation uh, is that it's essentially the cessation of tanha, the cessation of craving in, in a mind that's very, 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 very developed so that greed, hatred, and ignorance uh, no longer arise. Or if they arise in the most minimal sort of way, they are instantly self-liberated. They, they, they cannot take root. That's a beautiful way of understanding cessation. Um, in my view, all three kinds of cessation are true. In any case, what's your aim in practice? You know, the Buddha's invitation is into a um, cessation of, uh, of craving, minimally and having a mind increasingly that has ceased to crave. And in my view, clearly, he was recommending a growing capacity to, in some sense, be in touch with unconditionality, that which is unconditioned, which may also, as, as later traditions have taught, and other contemplative traditions have taught in this world, that the unconditioned ground of all also has qualities of of awareness woven into it, kind of a fundamental transpersonal consciousness and even love. And if that's meaningful to you, let it be meaningful to you and don't evade a real consideration of it. Cessation, nirodha. Okay. And then the fourth ennobling truth, the path of cessation, the path to cessation, the path of ceasing. Uh, there is a path. And you may know this path, it has eight elements, and they're organized in th three sections, in effect, um, that have to do with the three pillars of Buddhist practice, sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila, translated often as restraint, maybe a better, broader translation, because it's not just about restraining the bad, it's about promoting the good, uh, would be virtue morality sometimes, but it's, uh, you know, grounding in a fundamental decency, a fundamental um, good character, uh, sila. Second, samadhi, uh, purification of mind and training of the mind. And then panya, wisdom, insight, um, understanding, wise view. So in the Eightfold Path, we have... Um, I'm going to kind of do it out of the very common order, consistently with the order I gave it there. So what's under the heading of virtue in your own practice? We have uh, three elements there. Uh, why, I'll, I'll, I'll use the word right rather than wise because it has a certain edge to it that could well be a good translation, a little better translation than wise, although it's it's both right in sen the sense of being correct and and um, 
auspicious and moral as well as wise in terms of practical self-interest. Okay, so we have right speech, uh, six attributes of right speech. Um, you know, the, the speech is, is right or wise if it's uh, well-intended, actually beneficial, true, uh, timely, without harshness, and ideally wanted uh, right speech. The three elements of cessation, um, uh, so the way I summarize them, just to go back very briefly, that I see, and maybe there are others, but I can see these three ways that cessation is spoken of. One, it's a kind of a meditative state. It's not even a state, it's like a stateless state. But basically, it's a kind of uh, a person practices, they're aware, minimally aware in a place of just pure awareness, and then lights out, and then lights on, you know, some minutes later, or even an hour or two later. Um, and then that has benefits. And it's laid out in the Buddhist blueprint as an important thing to do. Another way of understanding cessation is that it's a cessation of, con it's, a, it's a dimension, a something or other, that in which there's a cessation of conditionality. There are no longer conditioned and therefore impermanent phenomena. A person has stepped out of conditioned reality and in some way has accessed or become aware of or permeable to um, that which is unconditioned, not determined. And therefore, since it's unconditioned, it's timeless, etc. Third way to understand cessation is a cessation, or at least a, over time, on the way to cessation or serious reduction of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, okay, so Eightfold Path, right? We have right speech and we have right livelihood. Uh, living in the world, um, you know, ethically, virtuously, right livelihood. Uh, and then we have also right action which is summarized as the, um, as the five precepts of not killing, not stealing, not lying, uh, not uh, being intoxicated, and not um, harming through sexuality. They're more complicated than that, but that's a good summary. And then we have, uh, in, so, and interest, so those are the three, uh, right speech, right livelihood, uh, and right action which at bottom are very much about non-harming. Then we have um, the samadhi aspects of mindfulness, right? And uh, right concentration, training the mind, developing the mind. And right effort in which we are releasing what is painful, stressful, unwholesome, and cultivating that which was very, that which is wholesome. That's right effort. Uh, lots of times people approach Buddhism or teach it as if it's a one-fold path of just pure mindfulness 24 seven. Well, man, if you can do pure awareness 24 seven, okay, maybe you don't need the other seven, but on the way to cultivating pure awareness 24 seven, you probably needed to do uh, the other seven elements of the Eightfold Path, which includes right effort, which includes all kinds of other deliberate efforts with your own mind, not just dropping into some kind of non-dual awareness and abiding there. Great if you can do that 24-7, but if not, there are these other um, steps you can take on the Eightfold Path. So uh, to summarize again around um, the Samadhi factor, uh, we have right mindfulness, right concentration and right effort, right? And then wisdom, we have two that remain. Wise view or right view and right intention. Right view is da, 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 the four ennobling truths that we've been exploring here, really getting them and really engaging them as tasks. Um, Stephen Batchelor has written many wonderful things um, on this subject approaching the ennobling truths as tasks, which comes from the Dharma as well. Uh, the first being essentially uh, that we need to recognize, right? 
what is the case. We need to recognize dukkha. Second, we, under, we need to understand the causes of suffering in craving. Third, we need to um, realize that it's possible to reduce on the way to ending and ceasing, um, remainderless ceasing of the forces of craving. And then we must realize this in our practice over time in the Eightfold Path. All right. So, right view, essentially the Four Noble Truths, and then finishing up on the last, and you might even say the most important of the elements of the Eightfold Path is right intention. Right intention. What are your intentions? And it's interesting that right intention is summarized in its three qualities. One is the intention to be unattached to sense pleasures, which has both a positive and a negative valence. It's basically the intention to become increasingly free in relationship to the hedonic tone or feeling tone in Pali, the Vedana of experiences. Some experiences are pleasant. Can you intend to be free in relationship to their pleasures? Some experiences are painful. Can you intend to be free, which means to rest in equanimity as you bear what is painful? And um, that those are that's a fundamental intention. A second major intention under right intention is the intention of non-harming broadly, which includes yourself. A person could practice for a lifetime in a very rich way just around the intention of non-harming of others and oneself, including in very, very subtle ways, non-harming. And then third, not ill will. Interesting, not ill will. Um, it's interesting that both not harming and not ill will are very socially situated in our relationships. And ill will is, you know, is the will for ill. It's like meanness, cruelty, contempt, disparagement, you know, sneering, snark, kind of ill will, wanting them to pay. Um, it's really different from seeking justice. Ill will is really different also from standing up for yourself. Uh, it's like, are you there to do them dirt? That's ill will, you know. And the Buddha called that out because, you know, as researchers have shown, we're very vulnerable to that. Uh, in our social packs, uh, including toward um, outliers, those who are other than us, ill will. So that's, that's right intention. So here we have it. We have these four, they seem facts, right? There is, there is dukkha. There is craving. There can be a cessation of the engines of craving. And there is a path that of practice that embodies less craving and less suffering along the way and leads to complete liberation of the heart, which has been realized fairly rarely in its fullness, but has certainly been realized hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of times over the 300,000 years that humans have walked the earth. So the question bottom line is, what are you gonna do? What am I gonna do? We're gonna finish the formalities here in a few minutes. How shall we be? How shall we live? And to me, that is what is so incredibly hopeful about the Buddha's deep teachings. Here is someone who um, was prepared to suffer immensely through the Jain practices of his time. And he came to see that that wasn't the path. There was a middle way that needed to see dukkha squarely. There is, and imagine the, the life of the Buddha 2,500 years ago, no anesthesia, uh, people dying in childbirth, slavery was routine, brutal wars, famines, disease, a lot of unpleasant experiences. But that wasn't the whole of life. He talked at length about, quote, that happiness visible in this present life. 
You know, he talked about the joys of good company. He talked about um, sukha, not dukkha, uh, in our meditative practice, experiences of happiness, peacefulness, and contentment. He talked about love, com- compassion, kindness, the joy that we can feel for the welfare of others. Right? But to deal with dukkha and to deal with our craving biology, we got our work cut out for us. <laughs> Don't kid yourself. Don't kid. We can't kid ourselves. And in this process of practicing with dukkha and tanha, right, on the road to Narodha, we need each other. We need each other right here. We're practicing together, aren't we? It's really touching. You know, as um, my friend James Barris uh, said, you know, as we struggled at Spirit Rock to develop more sense of community there, he said there are three jewels, not just two. There is the jewel, certainly, of the, of the teacher and the teacher within, and there is the jewel of the teaching. There's also the jewel of the community of the taught, of people who practice together in community. But, so here we are together. I'm going to respond to a question that just came in 26 minutes afterward, and um, and then maybe we can just sit for a minute together and let all this sink in. Uh, so let's see. Joyce asks, where does metta fit in to the Four Noble Truths? Uh, great question. So the Buddha taught for what, about 40 years. A lot of teaching, and there's a lot of scholarship about the age of the different suttas, and then trying to figure out loosely when he taught what, because partly sometimes he refers to where he is when he offered a teaching, and all that, of course, has a fair amount of noise amidst the signal, uh, because the earliest surviving written records uh, come from times that are two or three centuries after the Buddha passed away. Um, So there's some controversy about that. That said, uh, in the teaching stream, among many things, uh, there were there there was a description of what are called the four Brahma Viharas, dwelling places, Viharas, where do you dwell and what dwells within you, and Brahma being very exalted. And these four qualities um, in um, Pali, um, Metta, um, Karuna, um, Mudita, and Upeka, uh, loving kindness, compassion, uh, happiness for others, and equanimity. Um, these are available to us, even without being like the gods. And so uh, those, I would think of, to answer your question directly, are factors, are important practices to enrich this sort of central offering of the Buddha, who said again and again, see for yourself. He is essentially saying to us, hello, humans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is said that basically soon after his awakening, he you know ran into his uh, teaching companions on the path, or, or practice companions rather on the path recently, who could see that he was just lit up and, and something extraordinary had happened. And they said, "Please teach us." And so he then, you know, uh, offered the turning of the wheel of these four teachings. Maybe it wasn't quite so that way, but in any case. I think it's as if the Buddha says, hello, humanity, you've asked me what I can offer you from my own realization. These four things seem to be true. See for yourself. And you can relate to these four things as tasks, not as heavy burdens, but as opportunities, opportunities for practice that will ennoble you along the way if you practice with these four things that seem to be true, right? So to me, that's the very at the core. And then other things definitely have come in. Other things have been highlighted in the Mahayana traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Pure Land, wonderful stuff. Uh, myself and in this gathering, I so appreciate the roots of it all because it's so close to experience. Other than the teachings about the possibility of an unconditioned ground of all. 
Um, everything else is plain, pragmatic psychology and direct observation of um, our own minds and the nature of material reality supported by modern physics. So that's the invitation. So, okay, let's sit together for a last minute here. Imagine the Buddha teaching you this, right? Inviting us or someone else in the 2,500 years line from him, unbroken line from him to us today. And I, I imagine my teachers, and I imagine their teachers' teachers farther along the path than I am myself and still beckoning, beckoning us to come join them, inviting. Think of these four ennobling um, truths and opportunities as invitations. You are being invited. I am being invited. We are all being invited. Your heart is inviting you. You know it's telling you things. What's the invitation of your own heart? And how will you respond to it? Tonight, tomorrow, in all the days that remain to you in this life, how will we respond to this beautiful invitation? Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your support of others. Thank you for your support of me. Take good care. In the Buddha's final words in Stephen Batchelor's translation, which I love, things fall apart. Tread your path with care. Things fall apart. Tread your path with care. Thank you.